Thanks so much, Thanks Amy so much. June, and welcome everyone. Uh, appreciate you making it out to the session and the rest of Bad Camp 2020. It's an exciting uh, week. And as Amy June was talking just now, this is the last day. So it's uh, kind of we can we can kind of go out in style, I guess. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, that's all about. Um, for the agenda today, we're going to cover what's security first. What does that mean when you hear that? Um, security in the Drupal community. A little bit about the organization OWASP and their top 10 web vulnerabilities. And then dive into what I think is really interesting, and that's Drupal best practices and solutions. And then we'll have time for some Q&A. Um, I would say I'm watching the chat. So if there's questions that uh, crop up, I will try to keep my eye on that as well and we and probably stop to ask if there's any questions or just check in periodically as we go through each section. So we can kind of cover it there. So my name is Mark Shropshire. Uh, I go by Shrop. That may be how you know me if you do know me, um, but uh, you can call me Mark or Shrop. It's fine. Um, and I am a senior director of development at Media Current. I live in North Carolina, about 15 miles northeast of Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, I've been a technical team leader for a, for a while, and I'm really into mentorship and leading teams. Uh, I do uh, I do enjoy um, music, listening to music and uh, performing music, recording music and all that stuff. So uh, and just a few of the skills um, that I've uh, that I'm into right now. So Media Current, a little bit about Media Current to start off. Media Current is an open source expansion partner, meaning we leverage open source technology uh, to help tie in uh, all kinds of systems. And of course, Drupal is a big part of that uh, into an ecosystem within enterprises. And our mission, uh, it's all about bringing together the best and talented team members out there and building the best solutions for the web and applications. Okay, so let's jump into what's security first. Um, and Adrian, hello. I see see your mention there in the chat. So security first. Um, this is really all about uh, going uh, beyond beyond just compliance, beyond waiting till the end of uh, when a project's about to launch. Um, it's about thinking about security all the way through uh, your project and even into maintenance cycles following. Uh, I would just say security is hard. It's always challenging. This presentation is is really high level and, and uh, you know, you can spend years uh, getting better and knowing more about security, but things change uh, just like the rest of technology uh, in the technology world. So it's uh, uh, so it's 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 hard. <laughs> it's, it's simple to say that. Um, and then uh, but I did want to jump in as promised on the uh, abstract for the uh, session. They want to jump into some planning items that you may want to cover and think about when you're thinking from a security first standpoint. Um, so the first thing um, that I think is important is to really be proactive um, and get get with your stakeholders. Um, I like to ask um, stakeholders and they may maybe they're in the marketing team. Maybe that's our key stakeholders. They're in marketing, uh, maybe a chief marketing officer and team. Uh, I like to find out group who's your you know, who, who's the security team, who's leading that, uh, maybe a different area. And I definitely like to ask about that so that uh, I can go ahead and start building a relationship with those folks, build trust. Um, so they know that, you know, that I take security seriously and the team and that we want to go ahead and start understanding their, uh, their security concerns and, and maybe get copies of their policies and expectations. Uh, you want to have a layered defense. That means that while we're talking Drupal and everything's uh, about Drupal, uh, uh, you know, overall at this uh, back end, at least the core to a lot of our systems, um, layer defense means you want to um, have security uh, throughout your hosting infrastructure, um, you know, and, and all the way through the application. So it's not um, it's not just one thing. There's also just security aspects to think about with, uh, you know, are your uh, developers on encrypted hard drives on their laptops and things like that. So there's a lot to cover. Um, you also want to think about security through architecture reviews. That's a good place to go ahead and talk to uh, um, the security team uh, with your stakeholders um, and have them uh, review architecture with you and your plans. Um, I think some kind of continuous um, 
uh, development processes that are always good. Code reviews, uh, I believe, are critical. That's a great way to find security issues, uh, reviewing code. Um, so I like to require code reviews of all code going into a project. Um, and then also automated testing. That's another way to discover um, some security issues. And I've got a, just a brief example of that a little bit later. Um, of course, just continuous improvement. So just thinking about, hey, we've done, maybe we've accomplished and solved some other security issues or prevented some, you know, we've got some uh, defenses set up. Um, what are other things? Always be thinking about as a team, what are other things that you can do? Uh, and then um, I, I'm always interested in security audits. Um, these can be one-offs just to uh, see where the current project is currently at uh, from a security stance. And then, and then some type of ongoing auditing, I think, is great. Um, a number of, uh, of our clients at Media Current have systems, and, and I'm sure maybe you've run into this too, where they, um, you know, they've, they've hired um, a firm um, or a, a service to actually handle those security audits, which is, I think, fantastic. It gives us a lot of information. And then documentation is really key. Um, I know that um, you could say that goes without being said, but I think it has to be said always. Documentation can really help. Uh, and security, just like everything else in your project, so that others know what's going on and why decisions were made. So this is just an illustration of some of the steps throughout, um, you know, building a website, building a web application. You know, you've got discovery where you're trying to understand the, the project. This would be more for a new build uh, all the way through support, which um, which would be kind of more maintenance cycles. And um, and so just showing you that, you know, you should be thinking about security all the way through all these steps. It's a good way to approach whatever um, steps you visualize in your uh, process or have in your processes. Uh, maybe apply. This is kind of how we think of projects, but um, at Media Current. But I would I would say that you know think about how you would apply and where you would look at security through each of those steps through a project. All right, let's jump into a little bit on security and the Drupal community overall. Uh, first of all, can't, <laughs> this is so critical, I think, uh, to mention this. Uh, we, we have something that um, maybe some folks take for granted because uh, they're not familiar with other um, uh, open source projects, but we really have something special in the group of volunteers that make up the Drupal security team. And I just want to, these are the folks that are behind all the security advisories that come out on Wednesdays usually. Uh, they provide assistance, they write documentation, uh, they also help with the Drupal.org infrastructure and keeping that secure. Um, and there's a link here, and, and I'll, I'll get the slides out um, uh, after uh, the presentation today, but there's lots of links in here. Um, so don't worry about writing all those down or copy pasting or something. But um, but just want to thank you, send a thank you out to the Drupal security team. Not every open source project has something like this. Um, Lots of uh, corporations have security teams internal, but they're paying uh, those folks to do those jobs. And we have a very accomplished team. And, and uh, next time you you meet somebody uh, in person or virtually, um, you know, from the security team, you know, to say thank you for all you do. I wanted to mention Garter. This is a project that um, that uh, I help maintain, and uh, we've got some examples from Garter. But this is a security distribution. Um, and it's uh, it's really built around meeting enterprise security requirements, and it's got a lot of uh, best practices baked into it. We're always working to improve it. Love to have your contributions um, for that as well. Um, but that is a, a project that um, that I really uh, have a heart for and enjoy working on. And um, so, just want to mention that. But you'll see an example of that in just a bit today. So I'll, I'll stop there. I'm going to check, see if we have any questions. I see some hellos and, and all. Okay. I don't see any questions yet, but feel free to drop them in the chat. I'm keeping an eye out on those. Um, I'm going to jump in next to um, OWASP top 10 web vulnerabilities. Um, and you don't have to Google that. You can, you'll find it. Um, OWASP is an organization uh, that actually has a lot of great security resources out there. And the link there is actually to this top 10. And it is worth a. It is really worth every developer reading. Um, I, I, and even if you're not a Drupal developer, any developer out there, every developer should probably read this and understand what these um, these risks mean. And there's a, there's there's pages on the uh, OWASP site about documentation around 
examples of security risks and even more than this. This is just some of the top 10 and they update this um, every num every few years. Um, but, you know, there's a there's a few that we'll cover today a little bit. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's there's just it's a it's a wide gamut of things, frankly. Uh, you know, you hear about SQL injection uh, as a as a thing that you got to watch out for in development. Uh, where you don't want someone else to be able to put SQL commands in a URL and access a web page and have it maybe drop a table or that's a real common uh, one that comes up as an example or maybe insert uh, data or read data. Um, but, you know, e even things as simple as sensitive data exposure, which can happen just by misconfiguring uh, uh, Drupal, you know, and, and exposing, allowing access to content that um, shouldn't be accessed um, by a certain user role or maybe the anonymous user. Uh, and then um, insecure deserialization, that's come up on Drupal core with JSON API. Um, so the, I really encourage checking out this uh, site. There's a lot of great resources there again, and it's, and it's worth checking out for sure. All right, so, um, so this is the fun part. I wanted to get through all of that as a kind of intro, talk about security first, talk about Drupal community um, uh, contributions and things like that that are out there. But I want to jump in now to Drupal best practices and solutions. So we've got a few slides and then we're going to go into uh, an actual running Drupal site and, and kind of step through some real examples and you know look at some modules that can help your Drupal site. Uh, just a taste of that, but it's a there's a, there's a lot of um, modules out there on uh, Drupal.org that help you enhance security for your site. So this is just kind of a taste of that. Um, so the first thing I want to cover a little bit that comes up is module selection. Um, I think this is this is really a key piece of Drupal. Probably applies to um, uh, things like WordPress plugins and, and libraries you may want to include in other frameworks. But specifically for Drupal, um, things that we like to look at, um, and I've got a link to a guide there, uh, which is a blog post uh, uh, on mo module evaluation. But these are some things that that um, that I think are really good. You want to look at, it, does the module have um, a good amount of usage? Um, is the issue queue active? You know, are there, you know, was it, how long has it been since the last issue, uh, the maintainer actually responded in the issue queue? Um, if, if it's a module that hasn't had a lot of, doesn't need a lot of change, it's okay that it may be a while. Um, but if there's a lot of issues and there's not a lot of answers and uh, fixes and looks like a lot of problems, it's something to consider. Um, but that's not, doesn't necessarily mean that's bad either. You kind of, kind of, you have to weigh all these things together. Um, and then like, uh, what is, uh, is are there stable releases? Um, is uh, there's usually a note on the project page that will indicate whether or not it's covered by the uh, Drupal security team. Um, that's something to consider. And uh, and again, I'm not saying if you know you have to judge for yourself based on these and your own criteria and probably write you know uh, uh, policies that your clients may have. Um, so I've I've had some clients that if Drup if the module doesn't have a stable release, they won't use it, and it's not really. A Drupal thing, it's more of a, that's just their approach for everything. And it, and it makes a lot of sense. It becomes really challenging sometimes using Drupal contrib. And we have to have conversations about that um, sometimes to, uh, um, to work through that and, and explain that the module may be stable and it just may not have a stable release yet. Uh, but this is even more of a reason to, as maintainers, to get stable releases out. Um, it really helps the usage of those modules. Um, you know, are there... Uh, what kind of testing is being done on the module? Are there tests written for the module? Um, you know, release status, like, how, you know, stable releases, how often are releases happening? Are there at least releases into the dev branch? Um, and then, um, you know, and that plays into commits, uh, what kind of code's changing, the frequency of that. And then overall, reading the project information, are there good documentation uh, pages on the project? Uh, do, you, do you have an understanding of how to use it from that? And then overall, between risk assessment and benefit, it really comes down to, you know, uh, this to me, uh, a great example in this area here is if if I need a module to do something and maybe the module does uh, 100 things, but I only really need two things that the module does, it may be that that module by adding it has a lot of extra code that I don't need that, me, that is going to be running at some point. 
And it's better for me to maybe just write that code custom um, or maybe borrow some of the code from the module since it is open source and you can do that. Um, so those are considerations um, that are out there. Just, just understanding though, when every bit of custom, custom code you write doesn't get reviewed by a community either. So you lose that advantage. Um, but uh, the, the last mention here I'll say is that um, when it comes to module selection, you know, just understand that every contrib module that you accept into a project in Drupal and use, that's another module you have to maintain. You have to keep up with uh, security advisories on. You have to uh, be willing to work in the open source community uh, and, and keep up with those things to whatever extent uh, is required. But um, that does increase the attack surface, um, which is a, a security aspect. You know, just because a module looks handy and you install it and maybe you forget about it and it's enabled still, um, you know, that can later become a security issue if there was a, a advisory or an unknown security uh, problem with it. And so you want to keep that attack surface down, which just means in the Drupal sense, one aspect is to uh, have less code. You can do that by having fewer um, contrib modules, which is challenging sometimes, but it's still something to consider. Okay, so when, as developers, uh, if you're a developer and you're writing code, or if you work with developers on a Drupal team and there are co there's code being written, this is a good one to make sure of in code reviews. It's a good one to make sure of, uh, is, the is the team talking about this aspect, but use the Drupal APIs. Um, so um, I can kind of reverse this a bit. If you don't use Drupal APIs to do things like uh, work with data against a database, uh, like with MySQL, it's it's a much higher chance that you might write code, uh, whether you use it in Contrib or in your own custom code for the project, there's a higher chance that you'll write uh, uh, code that has security issues in it. And part of that's because the Drupal APIs have been uh, nurtured by the community over the years and um, many there's, there's a lot of protections built in um, to help prevent things like uh, database security problems. Doesn't guarantee you can't misuse an API. You can still do that. But um, I always, when, when I'm looking for an, um, I know I need to do something in code. It's always good to go into the API documentation, which is linked here and, and see, is there, is there already some um, APIs to handle that? If there's not, that's okay. You can write PHP. Um, but that's something to consider. I also added a link here, which is, is always really good, um, for, uh, writing secure code for Drupal. That's the reference guide, uh, on drupal.org. And I find that to be very helpful. Okay. So, um, I mentioned that the Drupal security team's awesome. I already covered that. I think we can all agree and, and give nice applause for that. Cause that's, uh, whoa, what a job. And I really appreciate them. So one of the things that they do is release security advisories and got a link there, uh, drupal.org slash security. That's where really all of this information lies. Um, but just some highlights for that. You'll, you'll see security advisories for Drupal core for the contrib projects that don't come with core, but um, many of us work on in the community. Also public service announcements, which sometimes are um, PSAs just to say, you know, hey, don't, maybe don't let anonymous users upload uh, files um, to your website uh, unless you've really figured out some other ways to protect those, the problems that come up with that. Um, I think that's an example that actually happened uh, a couple of years back. Um, that page um, slash security also has information on how to receive notifications. This is really good. So um, signing up for email, uh, RSS feeds, if you uh, follow RSS, have an RSS reader, um, and the uh, Twitter account at Drupal security posts, um, notifications as well. So that's a, that's a good one to follow. I find the email to be uh, pretty helpful. Also, um, uh, RSS, another, um, uh, thing to maybe check out is if you use something like Slack or some other, com uh, communication tool for chat, uh, usually you can leverage that RSS, uh, feed right into Slack or those other communications chat apps and, and they'll just appear, which is really handy. I kind of do both because I, I don't want to miss something. Um, you can get busy on Wednesdays and you know in the back of your mind that there could be, um, you know, a contrib uh, security release. And uh, so it's nice to have that coming in from a couple of places. And um, so as far as um, 
Another another place to communicate is in Drupal Slack. There's is a security questions uh, channel, and um, I don't usually have to ask the question because somebody in the community will. Are there going to be any releases today? And then somebody else will ask questions about the release, and I usually find someone's already beat me to the question, and I'll just read the answers. Um, but um, but other folks may ask uh, security questions there as well. Uh, one thing to be careful of is don't talk about security. If you think there really is a security problem on a module or in Drupal core or something like that, uh, there is a process. So make sure to uh, go to the security team link on the previous slide and follow their instructions on submitting security issues. You don't really want to talk about that in public uh, until at least uh, the security teams had a chance to vet uh, the, that issue. But I would say overall, uh, read the security advisory documentation that's there and make sure that you um, understand how to read a security advisory and what that means and and uh, practice that, you know, work on understanding how to read it and assess how important is it that I update right away. Um, some of those answers are given in Drupal Slack at times, but um, you can hear input from others, but you need to feel good about that you're making the right decisions and uh, does it apply to your site uh, and how severe is it? Those are really what you're looking for. So I mentioned earlier that I was going to talk a little bit about automated testing and some things like that. So uh, these are some things that um, we have in our Bitbucket pipelines at Media Current. Um, we we actually have all of our um, all of our PRs at least. We'll run Drush PM security, which is nice. Um, it's a good reminder if there's a, maybe there's a module that is reporting uh, requiring an update has a security update. Um, so we do run those. Um, we're, we're already checking at other places and other times, but um, I still like to have that there. It's just a, um, a catch all. The security review module, uh, which we'll talk about here shortly, that that um, uh, module is or that project on Drupal.org. We run that um, and it's all in um, runs through Bitbucket pipelines and you get the output uh, right there in text. So you don't just to note that there's there's Drush commands for security review, so you don't have to use the UI, but I'll show the UI in a bit. Um, we also run the OWASP zap baseline scan, which is a mouthful to say, but um, but we do use that. And that is a uh, what's called a passive scanner. It means it's not actively trying to attack the site or, you know, try to uh, you know, do cross-site scripting against it or SQL injection or things like that. It's really looking for hints of, you know, maybe problems with the site. Um, and, uh, and I find it really handy and it does find stuff. Um, we've had it find things and then that leads to discussions because uh, maybe the developer uh, that sees it first, they don't even really uh, have yet an understanding of what that finding really means. And then in our security channel at media current, we, we have discussions then the follow up um, and with advisement uh, for that team on here's here's all right here's how to handle that one or here's what we think and we'll talk through it as a team so it's real important to do that uh, uh, and have that team uh, to do and if you're not if you don't if you're not on a team it's okay that uh, Drupal Slack security questions is a good place just to talk about those things all right so I'm going to switch to do some demos here and let's see if I can change my screen share effectively i think i can all right all right so i'm gonna drop this current screen share and i'm gonna share my browser okay that looks like that's working well um all right before we jump into this little section here uh which will take up the remainder of the time any questions about anything um we talked about so far All right. See, do see a, a couple of questions here. Um, Gerard um, is asking about trying to move to Postgres, and um, uh, some modules tend to be DB specific. Do security measures address these instances? Are there preferred DBs? Um, I imagine there's some other folks here um, on this session. Uh, looks like we've got at least 34 folks uh, who may also have opinions on this. I'll tell you what my thoughts are. Is is overall Drupal uh, tends to work best with MySQL if because there are modules that just specifically support MySQL. There, um, there has been goes over the years to make uh, uh, the, you know, make modules and, and core certainly to work with Postgres. And I 
think it usually comes into play a lot with contrib modules that may not support it uh, properly. So I'm not an expert on that. I do, uh, Postgres, I do really like that database. It has a lot of nice features. I've used it in other places, but not Drupal. Um, so if other folks have uh, input there, please in the chat, uh, help out Gerard. Uh, Matt has a question. Um, how do you install and execute OWASP ZAP baseline scan? Um, and that um, that is exactly, <laughs> Matt, you found it. Um, fantastic. So yeah, we use the Docker image and Bitbucket Pipelines actually uses Docker. So we have a se separate um, pipeline step where we fire off Docker. And, and the link that's in my slides to the... Um, Media current pipelines, that's open source. So when I share the slides a little bit later, um, you'll actually see how we implement it. And if you have any questions, uh, Matt, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be glad that we want we want to get that out in the community and uh, and want people to know how to use tools like that. Um, all right. So let's jump in a little bit here. You know, we talked about um, sure thing, Matt. Uh, thanks for asking that. Uh, we, we were talking a little earlier about looking at modules um, and how to uh, evaluate modules for usage or uh, Drupal projects. Uh, this is, uh, I didn't want to pick on anybody else. So I picked on one of my uh, real simple little modules. Um, and this, this, this one is, um, and you can decide for yourself. Uh, this one's got some interesting twists um, because you can misuse this module and actually create security problems, which is why we have this notice right here, but this is one that I maintain. Um, it really just allows you to extend the time of the password reset timeout. And um, even though Drupal core allows you to do this up to a year, that is a really a problem. Um, uh, it's one thing if somebody extends it from 24 hours to maybe two days or something, three days, I don't know, it, it, use your judgment, but just note that uh, that password link reset link will still, still work as you know, uh, as long as you, ex you know, to whatever time you extend it. So, that's the warning on that one. But um, if I was to look at this module, let's say I needed this because I wanted the setting in the UI and I didn't want to set it in settings PHP. I wanted it to be user friendly or something. Um, I would look at this and see that, all right, there's a number of sites that use it. It's not the most popular, but it's not like, you know, three sites use it kind of thing. So that's something we've got stable releases for seven, eight and nine. Um, that's good. There's only one issue. I'll just I'll fess up. There's not any tests written. So that's a ding on Shrop. Um, so I'd like to have some tests written. If you've got any, if you're into writing tests um, and want to do that, love to have some uh, input on that here. But without getting into the issues, I'll just say that. So um, so that those are some things to look at. Um, you can look at the response rate of the maintainers here. You can dig into how much it's used per, you know, based between Drupal 7, Drupal 8 and 9 now. And um and because it's stable, it is covered. So the Drupal security team would definitely release a security advisory for this if it had a security issue in the future uh, and it was, and they were notified. So that's just a quick kind of preview on how, um, you know, kind of how you might want to look at modules and consider them and that sort of thing. And it's really, it's, there's not really a science to it. These are just, um, you know, the, those list of concerns we went over. Uh, there's a link to the blog post if you want to dig into that more uh, from the slides, but it's something you want to practice and get better at. And uh, you'll probably never be perfect. You know, you'll make mistakes on picking modules at times and realize it later. Um, but uh, at least from a security standpoint, I think we can make good assessments of uh, modules and things like that. And um, but I can think of reasons like this not to use this module, even though I wrote it. Um, so it's it's uh, pretty ironic. So um, and that's uh, I think that's pretty real. So I want to jump in next to looking at a security advisory example um, and some things I think about with these. Now, this is the um, this is linked right off the slash security page directly to a security advisor. I picked I handpicked a security advisory that seemed interesting to talk about. And this is one of the contributed projects uh, advisories. And this is um, so this is. For uh, views bulk operations, it's a pretty popular module. Um, it's been around for a long time for different versions of Drupal, um, and uh, it's it's really handy. This one is um, moderately critical, um, and one of the things that I mentioned um, about getting to know more and reading the documentation on reading these, a really important one is I, I encourage everybody to go and read up on the risk levels. Click to this link when you get a chance. Just some homework and read into the security um, risk levels and understand what they mean. Because 
they are custom set specifically by the Drupal security team. Um, and, and they're really, they're really important in how you read these. Um, and it being moderately critical, that's kind of, you know, in the middle of things, it's not, it's not, it may not be, you know, the, the worst security thing. It's certainly not a low security concern, but you get some idea that's uh, moderately critical. And there's also links to help explain those levels. Um, so definitely read those. That's real important. We see here, first thing I read access bypass vulnerability. Well, that does not sound good to me. So as a first read, I'm going, I don't like the idea that some, I mean, if I'm using this module that somebody can, um, bypass, um, any access controls we have on the site. So that, that's an, that's kind of a, a flag. And then, um, so the module contains access bypass vulnerability that might allow users to execute views and actions they should not have access to. That sounds rough to me. Um, but now the next line is really important. And this is always look for if the advisory has anything says anything about mitigation or is mitigated by meaning that, um, meaning that it's may not be the same severity for every site or every application in Drupal. And this is an example where, um, it only occurs in cases where you've got a customized action uh, access by means of a particular hook. So if you haven't, if you, you or uh, contrib modules or any other developers have not written any hooks and you could search your whole code base for this um, in your modules folders, but as long as you're not using hook action info alter, looks like we're okay. Uh, so that's good, that's good. So that, that's what you wanna check next on the site. Uh, you also want to check in which version are you running? If it's previous to these versions, you want to prepare to upgrade. Um, my recommendation generally is, um, you know, this is one of those cases where it may not be, you may look at it and say, Hey, I don't use that hook. I think we're okay. Uh, so we're not going to worry about rushing out a release, you know, this evening kind of thing and get it done right away. Um, but I, I would generally say, well, we still want to update it, um, uh, and keep it up to date. So, uh, so we roll it into the current sprint or the next sprint and make sure it gets done. Um, uh, I don't, don't still want to patch these things. Uh, but that, those are your decisions to make. And, uh, if you have questions, definitely, um, you know, work with your teams, uh, asking Drupal Slack, things like that for people's, uh, opinions and how they approach it. But that's, uh, and the Drupal security team will not, uh, and, and please don't ask them cause they always have to explain they can't but they won't tell you, you know, any more specifics in what's in here, um, because that can, that could leak information that would allow, um, hackers and others to, you know, exploit this, uh, in the wild more, uh, than it may already be. And, and we definitely don't want that as a community. Uh, it also has nice links to folks who have, um, assisted, uh, you know, assisted with, it gives them credit basically, but I think it's great. Um, credit's well-deserved on that. Um, so I've got a, uh, we got a question here. I'm going to pause since I'm kind of done with this section here and we'll jump into a site example. Uh, Jeff has asked a question, inherited a site that has a URL injection hack. The site is out of date with Drupal it's at 758 it needs to go to 773. So that's pretty behind and it's currently running PHP 5.3, which is also not supported. I'm, I'm adding that text. Uh, Jeff didn't say that, but that's, uh, uh, and it's being moved to seven. So that's good. Uh, so uh, Jeff's looking, if anybody's willing to spend a few minutes with some questions, it'd be greatly appreciated. So since we don't have time to dig into that, but I think there's plenty of people at Backcamp that could help with that. Um, please, please see Jeff and, and Jeff, um, that'd be a good one to also post in the main event um, uh, channel as well. Um, and uh, definitely don't, you know, don't post the URL like you, di you didn't do here, which is great. You know, you don't want to let a bunch of people know what, what site is vulnerable and you're working with, but um, yeah, I think there'd be, there's some talented security folks at this, uh, uh, conference and, uh, and experienced developers and others. So definitely post that. And I think that's a great question. I don't think that's an uncommon thing. I think we run into this from time to time and that's why we audit sites. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Jeff, for asking. That's why we audit, um, Drupal sites because, uh, people have, uh, you, you inherit these sites and they're out of date and they're way behind and they create, and of course it stresses all of us out. I'm sure Jeff's, you know, got a little bit of a increased stress level, but we'll see in that. And so, um, that'd be great to work on that. All right. So let's jump into a few of the, th um, security things that we can do with Drupal. So I have a, uh, let me, log okay. Ooh, 
here's the first thing. So this is a install of Garter um, for D8. And um, first thing I noticed, I was logged in earlier. You've been logged out due to inactivity. So I'm using the automated, Garter comes with an automated uh, logout uh, module. Which, uh, which banks and a lot of enterprises require. They don't want, it's, it's, it's a loss of convenience, but they definitely want to have um, uh, you know, security teams just, uh, they don't want sites to just persist, you know, uh, like the default settings in Drupal and a lot of web applications, frankly, where you're just logged in. Um, and by the way, you can, uh, you can often, um, and we had a cross-site scripting uh, issue here. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but, you know, you, we as developers won't always agree with the policies of security teams. I'll just say that up front. Uh, some of them are outdated, like uh, changing policy, changing passwords all the time and things like that. Uh, but sometimes, you know, it doesn't really matter if that's if that's uh, you're, you've got a client and you can explain that, hey, there's this other side to it. But sometimes, you know, that decision has been made and you just have to go along with it. But we do have tools to cover either way. It's always good to talk through, though, um, and educate, I think, uh, stakeholders on on security and implications because the security world is always changing. So let's look at um, uh, first we look at broken access control um, and I'm going to show the permissions page. So if I go under people. Uh, and I go to permissions. This may this this might seem obvious, but this is so critical. And I've seen like very talented developers like make mistakes here. So that's why I want to call it out. Uh, it's not fun. Uh, but one of the things that that I, I will make sure teams do before launch is review every permission. And it's not it's not a fun task. I don't even like doing it, but review every permission, uh, understanding what we want, expect of the roles uh, and review every permission and make sure that they're right. And, uh, and maybe you had somebody review with you on a screen share. It's not the not the most fun. It's not like writing code or exciting things, but it, it really should be done. And here's just an example. So easy to accidentally check a box. Um, and uh, and he here's one example. So, wow, this is a flag like anonymous users can create uh, articles. And uh, view publish contents fine for anonymous. Let's say that we're trusting authenticated users and that's OK for now. We can say that. But um, and I think I put another one in here, maybe. Um, I thought I did. That one's good. View comments. Um, sorry, I'm scrolling so fast, but I'm trying to remember which one I checked. Um, well, maybe I didn't. That may have been the one. Uh, well, if we're so this is an example. If we don't, if authenticated users not trusted in this way, at least, and it probably shouldn't be because you may have content editors that are authenticated users. This is bypassing all access content access control. Um, I generally am not going to trust all authenticated users to this. And um, that that's uh, that's probably an architecture problem if you are having to give that to out. And that's why there's the warning here. So but just an example that if this was set accidentally or maybe set by somebody that didn't understand implications of these permissions, you literally that's like as bad as as having like code that's got problems so that, you know, that's just uh, so access control, broken access control is a thing. You can also have broken access control in code, though, uh, where maybe you are. Uh, working with the access control uh, APIs in Drupal and maybe implementing them incorrectly or just, you know, have bugs in there that can uh, cause problems. Um, all right. So you kind of saw a preview to the next one I was going to show, and that's cross-site scripting. Um, if I go back to the homepage here, notice that this comes up, user supplied cross-site scripting error. So I had that pop up as a JavaScript alert. And it'll, it'll do this again, but um, this is an example. Now I, I posted this as the administrator. The administrator just by default had access to do this, but I, I could have gone further and set it up so that I accidentally configured text formats and um, and that would have done it. So if I allowed full HTML for like authenticated user, um, that's an example where a user can go in here. And if I look at the source, if I can run this, so this is a form of cross-site scripting. There's other examples. This is a real, the most simple one, but if there's, um, if I can run this JavaScript here, I can basically call a remote script. I can, I can do other things. I can run other JavaScript, have a whole script in here. Anytime the user hits that page, it'll run in their browser and uh, execute and uh, do all kinds of stuff. So uh, that's one to study up on and, and keep a lookout for. Um, you can also have cross-site scripting via code and, and 
Uh, sometimes we have advisories that talk about that. You'll see uh, where modules need updates. So, um, all right, jumping ahead, um, insufficient logging and monitoring. So Garter adds a couple of things, but I think just thinking about logging, what, what would I like to have as far as logs is important. Um, so the first one I want to show is uh, one that Garter adds, login history. This one's really handy. So this shows that today I've logged in twice to here as admin. And um, so it would show this, this uh, simple module is just going to create this extra report list. And it would show all of the, uh, um, it would show all the logins, um, you know, with, with the stuff that's on the page, you know, your user agent and IP address, that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's really handy to have as much um, additional login as possible. Uh, we've got another example and that's uh, the built-in core recent log messages. So this has a lot of information in it. And one thing Garter does is it sets DB log, which is this, uh, which is this watchdog. It's also called watchdog, but this is the Drupal uh, uh, main logging system. Uh, Garter sets uh, entries to, to keep entries at 1 million. You can change that, but it's the highest setting Drupal allows and we set it to 1 million. What can happen on a Drupal site, especially in development and in some production Drupal sites you'll find when you audit, there's a lot of PHP uh, notices and things that just eat up all of your logging, um, which creates another issue for your, um, you know, frankly, that's another security issue. If the log is too noisy um, and you can't see what's going on, then it's probably not very valuable because you're not going to catch a problem as easy. Um, now, larger enterprises usually turn this system in Drupal off and point it to uh, uh, like a Linux syslog. And then they may even use tools to aggregate all of their logs where they can search and, and do a lot of other fancier things. So, um, so that's, uh, but just want to mention, there's a, there's a number of modules uh, on Drupal.org that help with logging. And, uh, you know, if you ever need to have additional logging for your modules or custom things, uh, it's real easy to add those uh, log entries even to the built-in uh, log messaging system here. So uh, that's something to check out. Um, we're going to jump to password policies. So um, Garter comes with a password policy module. This is not the only password policy type module that's out there. Um, this is probably the one that's been around a long time and, and has been rewritten uh, for Drupal 8. Uh, it's just called password policy. So um, it's the one I'm probably more familiar with. And one of the things you'll find that a lot of, um, and I'm, I've got a policy set up here to show, but one of the things you'll notice, a lot, um, some security teams require password changes ever so many days, maybe 30, 60, 90 or something like that. Um, and what really, what we really found, uh, and this was a, this came out of a, a U.S. government uh, NIST report, was that what's really important is long passwords and having people change passwords leads to them posting it, you know, uh, where someone can find it and things like that. So, but this is just an example. So I don't think you need, I think the important things have really good long passwords um, that are not easily guessable. Um, but um, that can that can all be debated as well. And and what's important, two factor authentication is also something that uh, is important to do. And and you can add to your Drupal site as well to enhance this. Um, highly recommend it. But in this example, I just set up a thirty day password reset, which would definitely drive users crazy. Um, and uh, so I'm not necessarily saying that's recommended. Um, but just to show some of the capabilities, you can do things. There's a number of uh, plugins and you can add your own plugins, but you can definitely adjust like how, how long is the password? Um, let's, let's say the minimum has to be 20 characters. Um, and you, you can't use the username in your password and cannot repeat passwords. Um, uh, you can adjust how often they could repeat maybe every 10 times they could repeat it. But th to me, what's the point? Like always have a new password. It's not, that's not too bad. Uh, I wouldn't sweat that. Um, all right. So security misconfigurations, um, this one is allowing, this is a good example for this is allowing anonymous file uploads with the article content type. So I'm going to jump over to another tab here where I've got, I'm logged out. So notice I've got the login here. So I'm logged out, but by accident or just somebody didn't realize what they were doing, they've allowed me to add or a user coming along to the site to add content. Um, so I, you know, the person sees that and, oh, I guess I can't add content. Why is that? Oh, I know why, uh, it was cached for page. I think we want article. All right. So there we go. Um, so I'm still anonymous and I can create an article, 
and this this is this is really dangerous for a number of reasons obviously you can put cross-site scripting in here and um and load up other things that are allowed possibly if it's not limited uh, although it looks like javascript's limited here because of the text formats but if i can upload a file into a, a public file store which is what's set up by default that means you basically become a file host the site is now a file host if it was not on my local machine for any other um, malicious uh needs out there and uh and, and uh there there's a uh, you know, bad folks out there looking for the, that. Um, so, so that's an example. Um, and the last one I wanted to mention was using components with known vulnerabilities. Um, so jumping back here and, and it's, we're at 446. So I want to respect everybody's time just about to the end. Um, um, so this was the last one I wanted to highlight. This, this one seems so simple, but it's so easy to forget and not have processes around it. I purposely installed that VBO version that was had a security release. And right here in available updates, I can see that, wow, I'm really running. There was a security update on February 4th. I'm pretty behind. That's, that's rough. Um, so uh, that is, that's something to watch for. And um, you, you really want to make sure that you're up to date. Um, you also have to dig in a little bit on things like, uh, like for instance, jQuery, because Drupal, we got Drupal also backports fixes for jQuery. And maybe some scanning tools will report that you've got a, uh, an, a security problem on jQuery, but in, in reality, it's the fixes have been backported. And so uh, you have to kind of pull up those security advisories and and uh, talk about that with security teams so they can verify it with you, um, I found in the past. Um, and so the very last bit here, uh, and I'll double check. Yeah, Jay, I, I've seen too. People want anonymous up, uploads of web forms, and and it it you can do it. You have to implement other security measures, but it's uh, it, it definitely it's definitely something I think that um, stakeholders don't realize really what they're asking for sometimes. Uh, but I, I agree. Um, so we got through the demos. Did want to mention uh, there's a link in the slides here. Um, this is, while it says CMO's guide to open source security, there's some great um, uh, information in here, even about automated testing and processes. Also include some WordPress things. So that's that's cool too. Um, and uh, security incident response report. So we, we're giving that away because um, I want people to be able to um, have this in their, system, in their setup without having to go out and create it from scratch. Um, but it's something that's asked for by a lot of our clients. And any any questions, we can kind of um, uh, go to that. We, we're running out of time. So um, uh, uh, what maybe we'll hit looks like um, maybe the last one is, Jeff, how much of a security concern is having CK editor text format with no security filters when content editors uh, are a handful of known people? Uh, that's a that's a great question. That's the kind of question, Jeff, that comes up, uh, I think, on our teams a lot because you're kind of way in that. Um, it's something that I would have a discussion with the site owners about. And, and um, my gut is I would still try to limit and make sure they could only do what they should do. Because um, what I've seen, this is the problem. Let's say that we really, really trust those editors. The problem is people like to go on the internet and copy paste things. And I have seen where people will paste code and, and, and uh, yes, th thank you, Michael. Um, that's it. <laughs> that's the answer. They will paste directly from, uh, other sources and they think, Oh, it's great. Look, I've got this JavaScript running. And, um, um, so that's, um, that's one to watch for.